Welcome to the Recruitment Roller Coaster Podcast. My name's Hisham Azuz. Today, I'm uh, very excited to finally be joined by Chris Sheard. And if you don't know Chris Sheard, he is the founder of SR2, which stands for Socially Responsible Recruitment. And they are a tech specialist agency that are based in Bristol, currently have 18 people in the business and have been going for just over two and a half years. And for those of you that don't know, um, quite a while ago now, I did a podcast with uh, one of Chris's business partners, Alicia Teagle as well. So Chris, good to finally have you on, mate. Hi, right, nice to be on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's good. Um, really excited for this. I, I really do feel like, Chris, that a lot of people, particularly in the Bristol world, would love to know a bit more about the backstory of SL2, <laughs> I feel like, because uh, I, I think it's safe to say that you guys are a brand that people know about in Bristol from a recruitment perspective, um, which is a really good thing. So I guess first things first, Chris, where I always like to start, how did, how did uh, Sheardy end up in the world of recruitment? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm the same as everyone else, like you fall into it, don't you? So I was, um, my kind of career path was going to be a professional golfer. That was my kind of aim and ambition. Okay. Um, I had um, I kind of from childhood, friends with a guy called Nigel Romana, who's now MD of Opus. Um, he was working at the time with S3. I was kind of trying to become a pro golfer, teaching people, but ultimately spending loads of time in a crappy little shop selling Mars bars for golfers. <laughs> um, he was like, I was working weekends. He was kind of earning loads of money. And it was just like, that's kind of how the intrigue got. So he did a, a recommend a friend to S3 um, to kind of, he prepped me for the nines. I did an interview with them. This is going back a long time, like 2007. Um, and I got absolutely hammered for like six hours in an S3 interview, like, <laughs> across like four or five different stages. Was this in Bristol? Um, yeah, in Bristol, yeah. Mm. Uh, if I look back now, I cringe at what, what they put me through. But, um, what was it, I like Sam with his pen and like, all, like Sam with oh, yeah, like, yeah. all that shit? Yeah, it was like sliding me across the table. <laughs> uh, we did a... Um, one of them did like a car showroom, like role play thing with me. Uh, wow. where they just like proper trying to trip you up and everything. And then I can't remember what order it went in. Cause basically long story short, I was there for like six hours. I didn't, I didn't get the job at the end. Um, and the kind of feedback was that coming from like golf industry into like an office based industry, let alone kind of never even done like a nine till five was too much of a gap. So they basically said, you were very close. We suggested go away, get some telesales experience six months and then come and knock on our door again so I did exactly that so I've kind of quit the golf thing went to uh, insurance sales for like six six months of the day um just selling like car was it car home insurance yeah, yeah. so that's what I did um, yeah and then and it was easy really because I was obviously just super, super transactional on it. Of, yeah massively just purely on price like the, the call yeah, would yeah. come from a ticket so like I was hungry because I had a point to prove to go back like everyone else was just plodding along. Love so that. Like I literally six months to the day it was, I emailed in my sales figures, was top of the board. I was like, right, consider me now. And then I got the job second time round basically. But in that, in that time, in that six months of me doing that, Nigel had left S3 and gone um, somewhere so, else. But the time okay. I did get the job, my so, mate did. So what was it that point then where you like sales is something that I'm, I actually like the idea of? Um... I don't know if it's that. It was like I, my, the appeal at the time was probably the money. And yeah. I said I was earning like proper peanuts in the golf thing. I was at like seven yeah. um, seven hundred quid a month or something like way for working and living at home and stuff. Um, so it's probably initially the money. And I kind of went into it and not really knowing what it was all about in, in truth. Yeah, fair um, enough. Other than, other than what I've been told. So okay. yeah, it's probably initially the money if I'm being honest. Okay, so um, just, just to frame it up then, so first job in recruitment for one of the sort of most renowned brands, um, had a lot of people that worked at S3 on this podcast that sort of really speak highly of the unique culture that they created and, and these types of things. So for everyone listening, then, so your first job in recruitment was there and you, how long did you work there for? Uh, it was about 10, 11 months in the end. Okay, 10, 11 months, not, not yeah. even a year, first yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, so then, and then after that, joined opus yeah so basically my my direct manager a guy called ryan speed who's sales director still at opus he kind of was my mentor when i started at, at s3 or so futures so he kind of 
um, I should say this, but you kind of grabbed me for a bit and said, look, I'm going and I've got a new <laughs> opportunity and I'd kind of like to, to bring you to with me, with. basically. Yeah, yeah, um, fair. So I, you know, all of a sudden I was okay. in the bar having so, two. And that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so frame it up then. So 11 months S3 and then, and then how many years was it at Opus? Uh, six. Okay, six years and then round about four years at Randstad after that. Um, yeah. Before you set up SR2, yeah? So pretty yeah. much it was like 10, 11 years of working, employed as a biller, as a recruiter, billing manager, whatever, before you started yeah. SR2, yeah? yeah? Okay, so let, let just a few key things. Like for me, I, I really want to dig into sort of the two and a half year journey so far um, in SR2. But just, just a few things. So first things first, I have to ask you, what, what, what's your opinion looking back into what that culture was like at S3? What, what, what were the sort of key things that stuck with you or um, looking back now that had a big impact on you? I think for me, back in the day, back then S3 was like well known as being like the best for training. So I think obviously there's loads and loads of businesses. Opus, Darren was at XS3. Loads of people living in that business at XS3 and loads of other businesses recruitment have, have kind of spun up from people from S3. So they were always really well renowned for training. Yeah. Um, so I think the general gist was go there, earn your stripes, and then people would either spin out their own companies and try and earn a bit more money or go elsewhere and earn better commission. So sure. f- f- the appeal for me was the kind of training aspect and getting the kind of building blocks. But the culture was, yeah, you know, say at the start, like stuff you, you would cringe at some of the stuff that used to go on, like <laughs> not shave it. Like if you went in with a beard, it was like, there's the bick, mate, go and shave it. <laughs> or if you had, um, if you had like a, a pocket on your, this is obviously shirt and tie environment. If you had a pocket on your shirt, it was like, whoosh, like ripped off. <laughs> so, like, but, but, but what about, yeah, but like in terms of like, I don't know, because a lot of people say sort of the things that I learned there is stuff that I've used now and like just really speak highly of just basically what's really been common is that the standards or like this, the standards that everyone sort of worked towards and held themselves to were extremely high, which l- encouraged everyone to level up their game. And that that's sort of, sort of a common thing that's come out of it when we've spoken about uh, it. Yeah, 100%. So uh, standards and quality of, of everything that goes on. I think if I look at kind of the business now for me and exactly again what, what I've done previously, it's like the vertical market focus, having your niche, yeah, yeah. having a number of postcodes that you focus on that's like tried and tested in pretty much any successful recruitment business. And that's certainly obviously where I learned that. And that's the stage of me throwing. I've never been any team to do anything different. And that's okay. what they were strong at. So, 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 so when you then obviously joined Opus, which again, obviously from, from my, I, I don't know the whole story, but in terms of Bristol, Opus, in terms of the recruitment market in Bristol, I feel like Opus go hand in hand in, in that, in terms of it's typically a business that you think of. Um, so I guess on, on the Opus journey then, was it the typical route of join there with a year's experience and then just sort of climbed up the ranks to sort of a, a leader role? Was you then leading a, a team by the time you left? Yeah, exactly that. So yeah. we started day one, there's literally about five, six of us um, and literally starting it from ground zero. From really? The, kind of day, the day we opened the doors, yeah. So oh, wow. literally starting it from day one um, and... Darren, the owner's kind of aim and ambition was always to grow it really fast. So I think even in my in my six years, we've grown from four or five of us up to over a hundred. They're really? now at like yeah, they're now like plus two hundred different countries and stuff like that. So yeah. 2012, I went to London and opened the first office or the second office for Opus, the first office outside of Bristol. Yeah, um, I had that experience, but ultimately I just I just didn't like London basically. So I did eighteen really? months, moved back to Bristol, and then it was kind of right what's my options now basically okay so so just a quick one then what 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 i'm keen to just sort of get your thoughts on and then there might be a few things that go into this but what what i'm always interested to know is sort of why why chris sheard got the opportunities he did in a grown business when no doubt competition is high loads of people coming in into the business it was growing so i guess what i'm always interested in I'd, i'd like to think a lot of people that listen to this want to be the best version of themselves, want to maximize their recruitment career. So I'm just always interested on sort of Chris joining a business, four or five people, and then it's grown to a hundred or so by the time you left. Why, why did you manage to climb the ranks or why did you manage to sort of get those opportunities where you got to open an office, experience that? What, what made you get those opportunities, do you think? Um, 
So I, I think being a founder definitely helped and having that ambition. I think because, because we grew so fast, I was probably asked to do things far quicker than you would in a normal, either more established company. So like reality, I was managing people after certainly probably 12 months at Opus because it was like, we need someone to manage all these people that's coming in. So we all had to kind of step up to the yeah. plate and start managing people far quicker than you normally would. So I think I, I had a certain interest. I was far more interested in doing that than I was just sitting there and billing and making loads of money. So, so was that always the case? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd always, I'd always kind of been far more motivated by seeing other people get success than I, than I was myself. I was a steady biller. I was never like a superstar. I got to, principal at Opus which you have to do 200k to do in 12 months but I'd, I had to get the calculator out to make sure I'd hit that 200k <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd scraped it it wasn't Great like yeah, I've, I've done that easily yeah, so yeah, yeah. that was kind of I'd got to a certain level of principle and the next step I'd be just get your head on a bill and maybe get resources in and do more or you go down the management route but by that point I was managing anyway but that you kind of have to in a fast growing business but yeah sure that was kind of okay so Maybe this can also relate to SR2, maybe even your time at Randstad then, but I think a, a real challenge and is that sort of transition from billing to management. So I guess I'm sure you learned a lot during that or through that at Randstad or even now or um, at Opus. Like what, what, have, what were the sort of looking back, some of the key learnings on that then? Because I think that's a real challenge for a lot of billers that find themselves in a the management role. Um, what are some of the things that you found difficult or you learned during that period? Yeah, um, I think number one, you kind of mentioned find yourself in a management role. I think too too often, as everyone knows in our industry, just because you're a good biller does not mean you're going to be a good manager. So we have seen people that are kind of could be relatively average at billing, could be great managers. Um, mm. So I think time management is always the obvious one. So it's kind of you've got to be really rigid in terms of protecting that time. But I think from a certainly a business owner point of view, and the things that I've learned over time is kind of having a realistic number of people that that person can manage before something has to give. So being a hands-on biller and then growing a team around you and still being expected to bill, once your team hits like seven, eight plus people, it's almost something's got to give somewhere along the line. Yeah. That's either the support to the team or it's your own billings and the compromise to there. So I can, particularly as we've grown SR2, even really conscious of that balance. And what that, and, but yeah, that's interesting that you've noticed that. Okay. Yeah, so that, I think that's the key lesson. It's always just time management. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, what? Why? Let, let's let's get into SR two then, because obviously, so Randstad, Randstad, sorry, another another big brand, um, and and you worked there for was it three and a bit years, right? You said. Uh, yeah, three and a half years. Yeah. Three and a half years, and then was that just a straight management role, or was it billing or? Um, so I, I left Opus after six years, so about, I came back from London, looked at what the opportunities were, and then started to kind of get the, the itch to kind of set my own business up. So I nearly, I left Opus with the intention of setting up my own business with my friend at Opus at the time. Um, things didn't work out, um, and I was kind of left in a position where I was like, right, what is my next move going to be? So it was either going to be set up on my own and continue the route that I'd kind of planned with my friend, um, but I'd be on my own um, and obviously contractually I couldn't take anyone from Opus having been there for six years so yeah. that was one option then I just kind of weighed up what my other options were if I went to a different agency so Randstad is obviously a huge massive corporate company I'd worked for a startup for six years there's a sales manager role oversee the whole office in Bristol they had the London tech operation and um, Bristol wasn't necessarily doing as well as they would want it to which they were quite transparent about so for me, it was a case of I've got the opportunity to maybe almost prove to myself at that time that I could run a whole office per man and contract, but without the risks with it being on Randstad's money as opposed to mine, effectively. So, yeah, yeah. so how many um, people but, did you lead? Uh, so grew it at peak, so I think it was like 38 people. I started with about 10. I dropped that down to five, pretty much, and then grew that back up from five to 38 in about two and a half years. Really? Yeah, so it's a good, good journey and quite yeah. rapid, but okay. was able to there the cash flow to do it, obviously. Yeah, okay. Let, let's just talk about that for a sec, and then we'll segue into SR2. J just sort of learnings on, on the, the leadership side, which I think people will get value out of. What? But besides, obviously, yeah, the cash that you just mentioned, of course, I'm assuming the brand helped um, as well, but how what were some of the key factors that enabled you to to sort of grow the numbers by that do you think 
Um, I guess Ramsar is a very different beast. So it's, it, it is a corporate company. So I'm not at all a corporate person. So I think personally, it took some adjustment to get from a startup. Opus have grown so fast. It was a, at times a little bit kind of, you're flying by the, the seat of your pants a little bit, just holding on as it grew so quickly. Whereas it was a lot slower paced in Ramsar and a bit of a corporate kind of machine that took a bit of turning to get it kind of where we needed to get to. But I think the aim and my task was always to kind of, turn it around and start growing it quite aggressively. So that was always the kind of the brief that I'd had to do, but that was probably the first six months of analyzing who I inherited, what the business was, what was good, what was bad, what I needed to change, et cetera, um, before we could grow it. But they were, the managing director that I was reporting into kind of gave me complete carte blanche to, to do what I wanted with that business. So it was a complete change of culture, a complete change of personnel for the people that were in that business. It had gone from a, an account led quite a stale business ultimately and I was trying to reinvent it into a new business kind of 360 contracts and perm type environment for a very new business generation led so there were a lot of people that have been there for some like 20 years were part of the furniture there and I was trying to come in as a kind of <laughs> young lad trying to do trying to teach a new trick so it was an interesting experience but a really positive experience in terms of my own um, kind of growth yeah as I mean a, it seems sure. yeah it seems like obviously you had it in mind you want to start your own business so it seems like you just ended up taking the sort of the the great a really great path on learning for in a startup growing business grew quickly billing then leading and then you've got the experience and of joining a, a sort of big corporate the way that you just described it there so I guess so I guess it seems like you sort of soaked up some great experience to sort of give you the confidence to go right SR2, that this is sort of how I'm going to do it, learning from what I did. Um, so just before we go into that, what what would you what would you say the the, the main differences then in, in working for a corporate compared to a business like Opus or a business like you are now? Would you say like pros and cons? Would you say um, pro, like pro 100 percent the fact that Opus like Darren was in the office is always very present. Darren, the owner of that business, whereas you compare that with a corporate, even though I was sales manager running that whole office, it was very top down. So some like those examples like I give you where all of a sudden you get announced out of nowhere that you're changing the commission structure and you've got to roll it out to everyone. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, that'd be great. Well, this, this, yeah, this is not a good <laughs> change of commission structure. Like people are going to leave and it's yeah. like, yeah, you go and deliver it in the best possible way you can and try and put some sort of shine on it. <laughs> so it's like things, things like that. And exactly, one of my co-founders, Steve Roberts, was exactly that. He, I took him into the business at Randstad. He was my top perm biller, grown him, like developed him to, to be just a bit of a machine he was and changed the commission structure. And he was completely hamstrung and it was, would have cost him thousands. And he left the business. Yeah. So so, like, yeah okay. just, That's think, smart. just things like That's that. You have no, you have, you don't have any control of your own destiny, basically. Whereas I think with a short, with a smaller company, you can have at least a conversation if those type of changes need to be made then at least you can have a give your opinion on them should we say and maybe have some impact on the decision whereas you've got no chance in a court mm. okay interesting so okay so and then in terms of so, so let's talk about the journey that you've been on over the sort of last two and a half years what what did you make sure that you wanted to have in place or do or had planned that sort of you learned from it not quite working out of your friend previously or what you sort of took from Ransdown, Opus, whatever, what, what were sort of the, the things that you wanted to, the non-negotiables for you when approaching or planning on starting SR2 then that, that you make sure that you've got in place? Um, I think, well, I was, I'm quite granular in terms of the detail and the things that I wanted in place. Um, I was very clear, like, for example, when I started at, well, we had the same issues at Opus to be fair, sometimes it, even from like a technology point of view, like I remember, we were on like the worst internet ever. When I started with Randstad, we had like 10 people. When we scaled it to like 30 people, the, brought, the internet just wouldn't, it was, just wasn't good enough. It's like <laughs> even like tiny little details of making sure everything was in the right place and we had everything we needed to, to be successful. But the structure that we use now um, within SR2 is, is no different in reality to what was set out in S3 in terms of that vertical market focus. Yeah. And niche in terms of individuals both geographically and, and kind of vertically within IT so the market structure in terms of what each individual is going to be doing was the same um, 
working in a corporate was very kind of KPI driven. So it was very numbers generated. It was all focused on output, 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 numbers, 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 and regardless of kind of what story was behind there. So that's, that's never been me. It's never something I, I kind of believe in. Um, so there was lots of things I learned that I knew I perhaps didn't want to do. So yeah. lots of kind of things I wanted to avoid for sure. Um, but it was all, it, ultimately, it's just the fundamentals of trying to create a business that I would want to work for myself. So there were things that Ranta did very well. There were things that Opus did very well. And equally, there were things that maybe I wouldn't necessarily agree with that was kind of important that I wouldn't want to do in, in SR2 effectively. But ultimately, strip it back, it's trying to create a business that I would want to work in myself. Yeah, and I think that's really common, isn't it? So I guess... Who, so then, and then just give me a bit of context or people listening. And then is it, this is a business that you didn't start on your own, right? Or did you? Um, so I, I was on a kind of three month notice. So when I left Randstad, I obviously had the ambitions to, to, to set it up. So once I'd gone and um, in that time period after I'd gone, uh, Steve had already left, as I said, who was the kind of top term builder. He'd gone to pass this news. So I'd had a conversation with him and said, look, I'm thinking of setting up my own business. Would you be interested? He was. Um, once I'd gone, a couple of others or quite a few others had left Ramstad in that time as well, um, two of which are Alicia and Nathaniel. So Alicia, who you've had on your podcast previously, she was my first hire as I started to do the rebuild at Ramstad. Um, Nathaniel was my second hire. Nathaniel worked alongside Alicia at her previous company. So those were kind of three people that I'd, worked with for the best part of two and a half three years i trusted them we worked very well together i knew what their kind of strengths and weaknesses were so when we opened the doors of sr2 on day one there was well, pretty much within the first couple of weeks there was there was four of us there as kind of co-founders that all knew what we we're doing all knew each other all knew strengths and weaknesses okay. so we had a good really good solid start in terms of the quality of people we had in the business to really get it going from okay from an early stage and and um how and then like how so like i think and then back to sort of the point of wanting to build a business that you wanted to work for what was the chris plan on building a business that had an unfair advantage over your competitors like what what was the differentiator here or what was your plan on how were you planning on making your agency to be different um so i got my the inspiration for kind of socially responsible recruitment just literally by reading a book on holiday. So I was on um, on holiday reading a book called People Over Profit by a guy called Dale Parches, and he effectively, I'd always wanted to have my own recruitment agency, but the kind of concept or the USP of it, I'd never been kind of completely clear um, until I'd read that book. So he, the author owns a business called Sevenly, which sells apparel for charities. So they change the charity every seven days. They create t-shirts for these with the charity's name on they sell it, 7% of that profit goes back to the charity, but they switch it every seven days. Yeah. Um, so it's an American business, very, very popular, very successful, uh, also generates a lot of money for charity. So I just read the book and was like, love the idea, love the concept. And then my brain just started working, thinking how can I translate that concept into what I like doing, which is IT recruitment effectively. So that's kind of where the idea came from. I, we give 5% of our profits to charity as opposed to seven we change the charity every 12 months so to every seven days just because of the legwork involved with it effectively so that was kind of when the concept of the business became clear in my head mm. um, and, and that was one of the yeah differentiating factors yeah i think we've got quite a few like actual usps um as a, as a business so i guess we're we would kind of deliver the business as a community driven business so we separate that into the community that we live in which is kind of bristol or bristol based so we'll give 5% of our profits to charity. We've donated over 25,000 now to two different charities in the first two years of business. Um, everyone within the business sort of volunteer with that charity as well. So we're not just writing a check and ticking a box and chucking it over a wall and never engaging with that charity. So we actually yeah. volunteer, see what impact it's making in the local community. Um, and then we created a, a group as well called Bristol Technology Volunteers where um, there's a huge appetite in the tech community for techies, developers, whatever it may be, that want to give their time back to charity, but there was no platform for them to do it. So we focus our charity contributions to small local charities in Bristol that would typically raise about 100, 150k a year in funding. So A, our donation makes a significant contribution to that charity, but B, because they don't raise much funding, their their IT systems, their website, their volunteer platforms or organisations for it are 
like literally like prehistoric basically so we noticed actually we're working and partnering with charities that have got some serious it issues we've got a load of it people that we work with in our community that want to volunteer so why don't we just join the two basically so bristol technology volunteers just we engage with charities about what would they love to do and improve from an it point of view we put that out to people in the tech community they kind of put their hands up effectively and say i'll happily go and build changes a brand new yeah. website and then we just join the dots in the middle and say right off you go go and sort them out effectively so those are the kind of three key pillars from a community that we live in and then the community that we recruit within is obviously it so that's where we we gift a lot of our time and our our efforts and finances behind making sure that the tech community is thriving through events and meetups that we do lots of as a business yeah mate that's awesome and and so that they were sort of ideas that you had before you like actually open the doors or that sort of evolved uh yeah but I, i'd be lying if i said we had all of those ideas from day one so definitely the charity piece and the volunteering piece that was clear the tech volunteers came just evolved just in yeah time. yeah okay so we'd have those meetings and then the, the event we certainly do more than i'd perhaps planned to but they just evolved over time so we start we started with one in devops which was an area that we do a lot of recruitment in it was a, it was a meetup that just laid dormant in in bristol no one had done anything with it for like six months so we just got in touch with the, the organizer he basically just said i don't have the time to do it if you want to help me out with it and get it going again then that would be great so we we started with that one and we're now involved in like 10 different okay. ones but that's been a complete mix of things either supporting someone else's one creating our own ones or being asked to help out like the mix basically okay Re- really interesting I'm, I'm keen to definitely get sort of um just your honest thoughts and perspective on the, the marketing piece because i think that from from what i can see externally and i know what other people would see it seems like you, you've done that really well so, so i'm definitely gonna I'm, I'm definitely gonna ask you around the commercials on that and then how it's actually impacted your business commercially and these types of things so i guess just real, just real uh, practical things that, that I want to ask you. Firstly, um, w- when you started this business, a lot of people are sort of fearful of taking that initial leap um, and, and making that jump. What, what sort of time, like, did what sort of runway did you give yourself to, to in terms of like, did you sort of work that out or I don't know what, what? Because you, I mean, you got four people in quite early, um, which typically doesn't isn't the typical case of a recruitment business but is a typical case of those that want to sort of grow quickly so i'm assuming that chris's mindset was you did this was a business you wanted to grow first and foremost yeah Yeah. um what what was the runway that you gave yourself because i think that's that's something that i had to come up with and i know people think should i have six months of sort of money where i don't need to worry about billings or whatever what what was your mindset towards that or what did you have in place um i think about runway all the time (laughs) even more so now with uh, the what's going on um, I guess my mindset was always, if I'm going to do it, I, I want to do it properly. Yeah. So it was always to build a business that I could scale quite quickly and bring people on that journey with it and get people that are ambitious and want to want to grow and evolve with their company. So I didn't want to be just me in this little office at home, just in yeah. my pants, just doing stuff. I, I wanted to. So you knew that from day, day one. one. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in terms of how I funded the business for kind of complete transparency, I'd when I first left Opus and was going to set up then with my friend, I'd, we'd already been to the bank, had a bank loan in place and got funding where I'd, prepared, I'd had those meetings with the bank manager, yeah, yeah. had um, kind of the business plan presented, et cetera. So I'd effectively, when I was ready, went back to the same guy okay. um, who I'd let down previously and was like, right, now I'm ready. This is what it looks like. So I had funding, a decent sized funding pot from them. I then had, I then took a loan. What were we talking about? Six figures. Um, so I, I borrowed 80 grand secured my house against a loan with the bank and borrowed eighty thousand pounds and i had 20 grand myself and i borrowed 40 grand off my dad so i had literally 140 Fair. grand basically so a decent chunk i said how much runway that gave us yeah probably probably 12 months if we sat there and didn't do it yeah, 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 yeah. but um that would okay. enable us to be more than comfortable to kind of grow it quite aggressively which is always been the plan yeah i mean that that i mean that isn't i mean that is again that's clearly come from a place of you, this is a business you want to scale right so i guess okay so j- just to, just to frame up then so end of year one how many people did we end, end up at seven seven so seven of you by end of year one and there's four of you quite but four of you including you quite early on um and, and what did you finish on revenue wise 
or NFI? Uh, so year one, we turned over to just over two million. So our GP was 774K in year one. Yeah, so, so let, let's definitely talk about that because some people, um, I mean, a, lo- a lot of recruitment businesses early on don't, don't achieve that, right? So just quickly, I think a big part of this is sort of your your mindset, the money that you had and how you were thinking about it. So I guess with all, with all that money then, Chris, I think you hear and see it a lot now where it's like um, sometimes when people have all this fun and that money, it's just easier to spend. Um, and <laughs> so I guess... <laughs> What rather than those that sort of bootstrap it or whatever and more careful their money because they can't just spend thousand thousand pounds or whatever. So I guess from your perspective and what you've learned, what were some of the sort of key things that you invested in that really enabled you to hit those numbers and sort of set you up to scale further in year two? Like I'm talking tools, I'm talking if it maybe a lot of that went into people. I don't know, what were some of the sort of key things that have ended up actually being really good investments? Um so 100% tools. So again, in terms of my mindset of doing it properly, I wanted to, I didn't want to be scrimping and saving on job boards or advertising spend or LinkedIn recruiter or that type of stuff. So I was very clear that I wanted to make sure you give people, you get the best people you can, which I've had, which I had and I had the, the, the luxury of knowing Alicia, Nathan, Stephen, working with them closely. So get the best people you can, give them the best tools and the best yeah. environment you possibly can the rest should look after themselves in theory. What you don't want to do is getting good people and not yeah. giving them the tools. You're going to come up with problems. So, so. so what, let, let's, let, what were the best tools in your opinion and, or what have become like the best tools for you that have, have been great? So LinkedIn recruiter, what, what else have been like really good tools? Uh, so, so it's just standard toolbox thing. Everyone says <laughs> podcasts like Bullhorn as a database as a CRM we used. Um, Broadbean, um, a kind of multi-job poster, we used all the job boards, so literally, you name it, from an IT perspective, we, uh, there wasn't one that we weren't using from Monster, Reed, yeah, all yeah. the usual suspects. We had advertisements initially in year one across all of those as well. Um, that's just some, some of the investments, obviously, when you're starting, you don't have any ROI in anything. So my attitude was, let's just give everyone the best of what they possibly yeah. can. And then in year two, then we we're actually looking at okay, what was our return on that. And in hindsight... For example, like CW Jobs, we were spending a fortune on adverts with them and actually our return wasn't that great from it and we were getting more from our own website than we were from CW, for example. So we could be refine it a little bit more further down the line, but certainly in the, in, in the first 12 months. And I may, looking back, absolutely would have wasted money on certain stuff, but okay. I think it was worthwhile. To, to and and um, what, what percent, like how much did you spend on marketing in that first year, do you think, percentage-wise? Would you I, say? Wouldn't to, I wouldn't even know off the top of my head. It was it was chunky. What, what, what was your gut in? What would you your gut say like? What across like job boards and just, just and like just like if that. you would because like so you said circa two million turnover. What your profit was? I think one of the things that you guys have done well is, is the branding, the marketing. So I guess I don't know what's your sort of gut saying like roughly percent like how much of your how yeah how much money or percentage wise do you spend on marketing that sort of definitely would have helped you achieve that but how much do you roughly spend that on marketing do you reckon percentage wise I'd, I'd say easily 70 80 grand yeah like comfortably i think in terms of a it's a big chunk of what your costs are and in our world you yeah. can recruit with you can recruit with a telephone a laptop and a phone that's literally all you need in, in, in theory if you want to kind of do it super lean you can you can certainly do that and um, so it is a big chunk of your cost and yeah, if I was if I was doing it again and starting again, that'd be definitely something I would reevaluate in terms of actually what do we need. And for example, now some of the job boards we don't use, yeah, yeah, or we yeah. don't we don't advertise across them all because we just weren't getting any response from them. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting though, and I mean that's a pretty hefty number. That I mean, some recruitment businesses longer, but have been in business longer, bigger, may have never spent that sort of money <laughs> on marketing. Do you know what I mean? So I guess. How how much thought did you put into your brand? So you had the, you had you had the narrative, you had the charity, the social responsible, which I think is awesome. Was that the only sort of part of I don't know? Was that the only part of the brand that you thought of? Because I think like from the face of it, it seems like I don't know. You've tried to be a bit different. Like if you look at your website, you've got like dogs everywhere and like just different. Like do you know what I mean? So I guess how how else? How much did you think about? the marketing of SRT besides the narrative and the story of the, the social responsible piece, or was that the main piece? Um, 
So I think things like that, when we're starting out, so if you, again, it goes back from my point of view to, to like doing things properly. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not good at marketing. I'm not good at branding. That's not, that's not what, that's not my strength. So yes, I had the narrative and I came up with a name in terms of SR2, social responsible recruitment. Once I had that and I had the ethos in terms of what I was trying to create, I then went to experts and went to, you know, I outsourced that to a, a designer, a brand person and said, right, this is what I'm trying to create. Okay. Go ahead and come up with, come up with some branding behind it. And they came up with four or five different ideas. The narrative behind the, the dogs and stuff was, was the one that stood out for me because I wanted to do something different. There's no point from my point of view in just being another agency that's doing exactly the same, like it's just pointless. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're very clear in terms of wanting to try and, maybe do something a bit risky or sort of or standing out from the crowd certainly so even like the content and the copy on our website that's not been written by me I went yeah to yeah of course and, and but i think i think a lot of people it's a second thought it's a second thought like you going through that do you know what i mean i think this is what i'm going to go into now which i was keen to ask you chris because i think this is from what i'm understanding and know about your business is probably what you've done well is that i don't know the conversations you may or may have had with other sort of recruitment business owners is that typically sometimes people can fall in the mindset of like i'll do i'll do that when i get to such and such this milestone or i'll do that i'll worry about that when i get to x heads or when i get to x profit but clearly you're someone that had the mindset of i'm going to do it from day one or do it as early as possible do it properly do you get what i mean yeah. so i think that that's yeah, why yeah. i just wanted to talk about that because some someone might have gone through that process after they've they've done it for a year and do, do you get what i mean so i guess what were some of the so I guess just to frame it up as well and help me. So was Chris's role, like, was you just focused, was you billing or was you just, was your role very much like make and maximize the people um, and get the most out of the people you bring into the business? No, so I mean, day, day one, I was, I was billing. So I, ha I hadn't kind of been hands on on the tools trying to bring <laughs> money in for like five, probably five, maybe six years. Um, Ramstad was completely hands off opus towards the end in london was largely hands off so certainly five years whereas but when we started with sr2 there was four of us we had a database we had literally an, an empty bullhorn with nothing on that yeah, so yeah we had to like it was just roll up your sleeves and try and get on it so i first five months build a giant 75 grand <laughs> like um but i mean because like first the first six months was very much like right bless you all just go at it and build what we can as much as we can yeah. and then once we kind of found our feet we had some clients paying invoices we could see where How we were take? Um, um, so we first deal took literally just less than a month which is believe it or not me um well you you got that yeah I actually got <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it was a crap deal it was a pretty crap deal but anyway they all can't so that was the first one um our first invoice that went out the door it's quite funny looking back in preparation for this our first invoice went out the door was a was a hundred percent rebate job after the first <laughs> week so we placed like an it support female um in some company in gloucestershire and she started on like a wednesday and then we come in on a Monday morning. Bear in mind, it's the first invoice we sent out because my guy didn't start until the next year, until 2018. Um, and they were like, yeah, we've, we've had her in, we've had to get rid of her because she'd literally taken her company laptop home on the weekend and was on material that she shouldn't have been on, basically. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we had to get rid of her. So we are like, okay, don't worry about paying that invoice. <laughs> um, that was our first one. So yeah, it was, kind so of went from there, but... And then, and then after that, then did it? Because I, I feel like what I, I've sort of gathered from you is that your like your role is very much more about really focusing on the business. Yeah, hundred percent. So I'd say certainly the first six months was all about right, like let's get, get the wheels turning. Yeah, get 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 some money and get some things turning. And once we built up our, our client base and stuff like that, and you can see things were moving in the right direction, it then very much went on to operational strategical stuff hiring has been a, obviously a huge aspect of what we're doing so much we're getting the right people into the business so yeah. our first hire was like after six months i think yeah. the first person started in april which was five or six months after we'd started yeah, and yeah, yeah. so we finished the first year with seven seven as a headcount yeah okay cool so i guess so then so then was it from like six months onwards where like your sort of role had then gone into like very much strategic on the business and I'm, I'm sure you dabbled in it every now and again, but it's it's been a lot more focused on the business. And was that yeah. always the plan? Because obviously that's clear. Uh, but. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's enabled us to grow quite fast. 
I would say, because the, uh, my strength never, as I said at the start, I was never like a mega biller. That's yeah, not yeah. my my place, you know what I mean? So this, this kind of doesn't benefit the business for me just to be on the tools and year three still trying to bundle through 150K. Yeah, it was just kind of no point in that. So <laughs> I think the quicker we could do that, the quicker we could start to scale the business and put things in place to do so. So having, but equally, I said I was really fortunate having Alicia, Nathan, Steve from the outset. They're all very experienced, very good billers, very good at what they do they could crack on with that and look after the sales side of things then and i could actually focus on the business and start yeah yeah and and no, I th- yeah i mean that, that that makes sense that, that that's had an impact i guess just a quick one before we sort of go into that journey then is did you did everyone know that like did you over communicate that look guys you know i'm not the best biller i will i'm rolling up my sleeves let's do, do this but just so you all know this is sort of where i want to be because I, I feel like uh, that's important uh, yeah, it was probably pretty obvious after a few months. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so f- from the outset, I mean, that said, they, okay. they've worked, they've worked with me around, so they they knew what my role was and what my strengths were in terms of what we what we did there. So that was was very much the ambition. So there was never any questions of of that. And as as the, there's, there's, we had no one from a back office point of view, so anything in terms of invoicing and payroll and all that sort of malarkey, that that was me. I was everything back office, everything marketing, everything yeah. operating all that sort of stuff. So as you grow and as it gets bigger and more stuff's going on, there's more moving parts, it starts to suck up a lot of time. So I was, mm-hmm. I was gradually being like eased away from, from it naturally just because of all the other things that were going on. Even events and stuff like that take time organizing and the logistics of them. It all, it all takes time. Effectively. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, no, I, I just think that that's interesting because I think a lot of businesses that are at that sort of size, the business owner typically just really feels like that they're, they're never going to be able to sort of get their head above the water and be on the business. Um, but I think clearly what you've done well is, is made sure that one, you communicate that that's what your plan is going to be. And also you, you get the people around you to do um, what obviously they're great at in terms of billing sales, blah, blah, blah. And you, you pick up the rest. So I guess let's really talk about that journey then in, in growing this business. So it seems like year one um, had a great platform then to, to grow this business further um i guess what what were sort of going into year two then chris what were some of the sort of key learnings i mean clearly had a a, a good great a good start right which helps which no doubt fills you with confidence yeah so, so i guess what were the sort of key learnings going into that year two where you're like right we did this really well in year one or this was a big part as to why we managed to get to where we did in year one that you're like right let we need to build on this now and what 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 was your sort of mindset going into year two? It was very much so. We so we finished year two on sixteen people. So the kind of focus was definitely headcount growth in terms of what we're doing is working. The brand was landing really well with clients and customers. We were finding it pretty easy, I would say, to to win new business and bring customers on. It was attracting kind of lots of interest to the meetups and events we'd started doing again had, had, had kind of been working really well for us so there was nothing that we, we weren't like year two like all right let's drop that let's spend yeah. a bit more time doing this it was just a case of let's double down and do more of the same of what we're doing and so we went we we're never trying to reinvent the wheel i think it's really easy to overcomplicate recruitment it's actually quite a simple thing it was just like let's do the basics well let's give people the right environment to work in and get the best out of people and let's just work our backsides off and, and kind of build it from there. So what, there was nothing revolutionary we did in year two that we hadn't already begun in year one. It was just more of the same. So more of the other things that we were doing, More there were more events. There was more of a focus on women rock that Alicia was kind of doing successfully in terms of diversity and inclusion stuff. There was just, it was just more of the same. Effectively. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, whenever we've spoken, I feel like what, what you've been good at is, is really is being able to um, hire good people for your recruitment business. Um, and, also, and, and that's obviously a real common challenge for a lot of recruitment businesses, right? So yeah. I guess let, let's definitely talk about that for a second in terms of your learnings through that because it seems like that obviously your past, you've probably learned so much in just getting better at sort of what to look out for, what not to look for. Um, and these types of things so i guess and and to tie in with that um well actually no yeah let, let's just focus on that i guess like in terms of going from basically doubling the head count which a lot of people struggle to do and, and struggle to push past that nine ten head um head count mark etc like what 
was you just did you just like did you just hire one after the other did you hire a group of people together what what was the actual hiring strategy was your mentality of we're always hiring you're always meeting people what what was the mindset um so i've never i think i've only ever hired two people at one time in terms of two people starting on the same date where the strategy was always to go for experienced people interesting um, because we just I didn't have I was going the to say, time. You we didn't have the train. The no, train yeah. we didn't have the time. We didn't have any. Of the, I didn't have the time to train people from scratch in terms of there's the phone. This is how you dial a phone number. We just didn't have the capability to do it, um, or, or the time to do it. Have the capability, but so that that was a that was definitely a strategy. So our, our kind of sweet spot has been people that are like three months to twelve months experience. So people that have maybe gone into a com- uh, into a company and it's not been the right culture fit or haven't maybe even necessarily seen any success at all and then we've maybe picked them up as like job job two basically yeah and um, so th- those are people that you don't need to teach the fundamentals to but they're also people that maybe aren't stuck in their ways or yeah, aren't yeah. thinking oh well we used to do it like that they're the kind of people that are still open still want to learn still hungry because if they've failed somewhere else but still want to make a success fit in recruitment and they've still got some fire in their belly as well so the vast majority, I'd say, over half of the people in our office are are those people that would fit into that second job cut up yeah. category, three months, twelve months experience, and then we. So, really so what? How, how did how did you get these people? Like, did you use Rectorex? Did you? Uh, like, no, so I I've I've only used the Rectorex once in two and a half years. Um, not because I wouldn't, um, but because I think I'm probably super busy on LinkedIn in terms of like. I always say like just nosy. I think hiring and finding people and getting people interested and interviewing is probably I would say my main strength. Yeah. So, but how are you think, doing that? So, I would always like even now, like once a week, I'll go on the job boards and I'll do kind of like what recruiters are on the job boards over the last week. So I've picked up a couple of people. That from from that means that I've either put the CV up thinking I'm not happy. I'm looking. Okay, so you, so you always look in. Yeah, always looking. Um, LinkedIn, I said I'm, I'll always kind of message people directly. If ever, if ever anyone looks at me on LinkedIn locally, who I think might be of interest, then I will follow up with a message and be like, I, I wouldn't be like, oh, hey, I've seen profile. <laughs> but it's like, you, you'd start some level of engagement in terms of a conversation. Okay. Um, and the amount of times if I haven't done that, you then see that person's left that company and has gone somewhere else. And I'm like, damn, I've, that's okay. why they were looking. Um, but I think you, you should always be interviewing whether you're hiring or not, in my opinion, because I think you, you, you can gain so much more from it just in terms of what's going on in the marketplace. And even if you're interviewing people you might not think could be the perfect fit for your business, A, they might end up being, but B, even if you don't, you can still get some sort of nugget of information yeah. that might then lead to a good hire. Okay, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. So, so you've always been proactive, and I think the way you've ended up structuring your business and the people who got into it is enabled, because I think that's what business owners don't have the time to do. Is it that is like that is yeah, yeah. obviously you had you do other stuff, it's not completely takes your full bandwidth for what Chris does, but I'm sure that's a good chunk of your time and what you're doing, especially if you've yeah. got those obviously aggressive numbers and you're spending a lot of time on it. So, I yeah. guess, I mean, from no, sorry, go on, was you gonna say? I was just I do think I think the brand has been far more kind of powerful than maybe I would have first thought as well. So we do get a lot of people, a lot of like some, a lot of our people have just applied directly or emailed. Yeah, so that was going to be my next thing. E- e- emailed like info at um, mailbox. Why do you think like, that is? I think it just like, for me, it's just like, I think it's, we certainly come across and I would hope we come across as just authentic in terms of what we do. So our industry doesn't have the greatest reputation. Everyone knows that there are some great people in our industry, but equally in the same as any industry, you know, we're, we're, we're tarred with the kind of estate agent car salesman type mentality. So I think if you can create something that stands out, is authentic and genuine to show that actually you're not a dickhead, you care about what you do, you care about your industry and want to make a positive impact in it, you will stand out. So I think those, it kind of goes back to creating a business that I would want to work in myself. So the no cape, we, our culture is really good. And I think that we're good at kind of transferring that culture through our social channels, for example. Yeah. So and, I've had plenty of people come to us in an interview and be like, 
like what is it actually like to work there it's, sometimes it looks a bit too good to be true it's something i've heard like countless times that's what that's what i mean that was my next thing because i think that's what you've done you guys have done well strategically or not strategically uh, i think it's probably a, bit, a mixture of both it sounds like that you you just you guys have just got good at communicating what you guys are up to what you're like online and ultimately i think when i look at you and your team and your business i think from a internal standpoint i think you guys just look really human and I think there's just so many recruitment businesses that don't look human um, and they're so worried about sort of how they come across and all this. But you guys, are, yeah, it's, it's the authentic piece. But I guess that that was my next thing, Chris, because I think having met a couple of people from your business, I think that's all great if you can do that. But if that doesn't translate into actual real life, then it's fucking pointless. So I guess yeah, yeah, yeah. you must have been instrumental along with obviously the, the early people that joined you on sort of what was the strategy or what have, what how have you sort of cultivated that culture i guess a big part of that is making sure that the people you're bringing in are show indicators or show things that are in line like what what have you done to ensure that people are adding to the culture rather than taking away from it yeah so i think 100 percent my mindset would always be i mean you, obviously people have their own intricacies and their own their own little quirks naturally but i think people's core beliefs and fundamentals in terms of what good recruitment looks like or what they're like as a person needs to fit into our culture so i've interviewed like even like top billers at other companies like 250 plus billers i've interviewed a couple of examples i could i could think of and great billers and the numbers commercially would clearly obviously add up but culturally they just wouldn't fit into our business and i might add a 250 biller but i'm going to lose 300k 120k billers so commercially yeah, yeah. It wouldn't make sense so i would always put our culture ahead of and our people ahead of kind of anything commercially from that point of view so I think we've been very good at finding the right type of characters that aren't your stereotypical recruitment type people anyone that's kind of interested in purely themselves and just interested in how much money's in their bank and just not going to fit into our business and I, I, they just wouldn't be hired so they wouldn't fit so we're, we're very kind of picky I would say in terms of who we do who we do hire and who does kind of make it mm. into the day one and I think it's worked and was you always like that, or is that something that you just had to become really strict on? Um, it's le- if you're, it's very different when you're spending your own money. <laughs> number one, <laughs> so like I can think of ramp up days where where the the objective was grow, 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 grow. I was given a, a P and L and targets which are really super aggressive, and they might be like. 45 people and I'm looking at it saying, oh, I've only got 20 people. So I've got to get 25 people into my business ASAP in order to hit that target. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. I don't really think I'm ever going to hit. So you can almost be like pulling in different directions. So I can look back at people higher there and you just think, okay, that was a mistake. And just naturally with experience, you learn as you go in terms of what's going to fit, what's going to work. And I'm, I'm, we, I still don't get everything right. No one, I don't mean, yeah, of we hire people, we hire people, you're never going to get everything right. But I think our, our success rate with FRT has been like really high. Our retention has been really high. So we've lost in what were like 31 months. So just over two and a half years, we've lost six people. Three people have resigned. Uh, one of those was to go and become a chef and two went internally at one of our clients. So I've never left. I've never lost anyone to another recruitment agency. And um, the other three people I kind of exited because they weren't kind of up to, up to standard in, in yeah. truth effectively so our attention has been pretty good but even you, you still make mistakes i'm sure i'll still make further ones in the future yeah but i think we're quite picky in terms of who we go for and making sure that culture fit is always right for us for the business so, so, so let's just talk about that for for a sec then and leading up to now as well what what things have you done because it's because that's the other part actually then keeping the good people in your business and i think that that can be quite challenging when you're in a sort of smaller growing business um, because obviously yeah, everyone wants career progression. Everyone wants to know that there, there's great opportunities in the business that they're in. And sometimes that can be quite hard to understand or think about how you can make your employees think or understand what the opportunities are. So I guess what, what, what do you think are the things that you guys, you, you guys have done well or implemented that have really impacted the retention of your good people? Do you think? Um, like number one, just obviously, treat people in, in the right in the, in the right way number one so we we certainly don't pay the world's greatest salaries i'm sure there's companies that will have kind of bigger bigger wallets than us but we've got really good and competitive commission structure we we kind of 
are, are as flexible as possible in terms of late starts, early finishes, creating that environment where we don't have KP, we don't KPI, we don't manage by numbers, we give people autonomy, we give them the tools to, to be as successful as it can be. We obviously support people, but in terms of day to day, it's very much the kind of ethos is set people up in the, in the right way and then just give people the, the kind of autonomy to go about their job in, in the way they want to. And, it's, and if people are on the same page in terms of having that ambition to want to be successful and do a decent job and you create the right environment for them to thrive, then you know, ultimately why would people want to leave your business if they're, if they're seeing success? So mm. we're, that will always be the same in terms of as, as we grow and uh, you know, everyone we hire fits into that culture. Now we've got more junior people, as I said, how we would manage and motivate, we say more junior people might be different to more seniors, but we've hired some really successful principal people that have come in and done a great job and that had literally wouldn't ever have any conversations in terms of day to day um, other than kind of what anything needs, people need support with. So I think cu- culturally it is very much the case of just treat people like adults, treat people with respect, give them the environment they need to thrive and kind of let them give them the space to do so. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But so many people probably don't just think about it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, um, so how, how did you finish in year two then, Chris, in terms of, so you got, you had obviously said it got to about 17 heads, what obviously we're always keen to understand profitability and what that means because headcount isn't always the, the right barometer of how, how well recruitment business is doing. But how did yeah. you finish up year two then? Uh, so, end of 2019, we did 3.341 million turnover. That was 1.315 in GP, and that was just over a million in perm GP. And then we did 257K in contract GP, and that was 16, okay. 16 heads. 16 heads, okay. Yeah. So it all sounds great at growing, doing the right things, but what, what, have, what have been the biggest challenges for you, Chris? Mindful of that we've, we've spoken a lot about the positives and like what, 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 what have been, I could even talk about now if it's now, but what, what have been the, the biggest challenges for you and things, yeah. Um, there's not, I was thinking about this obviously in preparation, there isn't like one thing I could think of and be like, there, there are little things I could think of like operationally I've got wrong, so... The, the, the big there's probably two big things that stand out for me which cost us money ultimately who are IT and infrastructure from day one um, I just I didn't I relied on someone that I thought I could rely on in terms of the provider I went to and it took me probably nine or ten months of pain <laughs> to realize that actually I was getting completely fleeced in terms of what I must have wasted 10 I was I was just paying at least double what I should have and could have been paying and the yeah. solution was, was crap anyway so our infrastructure wasn't what it was, and that was just my naivety only going to one supplier. I knew them. I thought they'd do a decent job. They didn't. <laughs> um, so that you know, cost probably say, easily 10 grand to us. And then I think the second lesson would have 100% been around the term, our terms of business. So really? obviously, as, as, a, as every company starts, you kind of your terms of business ultimately end up being a lot of mishmash of perhaps where you've worked previously and yeah, what you yeah, like yeah. and what you don't like. So they're kind of fudged together. I can, yeah. So, so basically they just weren't that strong. So we probably had, I think when you're, when you're a startup and you're a new business, there are the vast majority of people want to help you, want to support you and will do every, go out their way to make sure that you, you, you grow and you, you survive. And um, which is amazing. On the flip side of that, there probably is a smaller portion of people that will take advantage. And I think we've probably had, five or six now like absolute blatant backdoor uh, situations <laughs> and then when it actually comes to the crunch and I've looked at our terms of business and you're like actually there's no way in the world that should be allowed to happen but then you like actually look at the black and white from a legal point of view with a with a solicitor and you look at your terms and you're like actually these are pony like they don't yeah, make yeah. sense like they're just not going to stand up so that's been a lesson. So I said we we reinvested and had solicited. Would you would you have done, would you have done that at the beginning then? Well, yes, yeah, probably cost me forty fifty grand in fees that we should have had that we haven't. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Someone messaged me about that. Sounds like really mundane and boring, but someone just messaged me like, "Have you got any content?" I spoke to them about terms of business because I think it's things like you just said can happen, and sort of as you said, it can be a mishmash at the beginning. It's just like people like 
you're sort of a bit nice. I, I've probably been, I'll be honest, I only actually got my clients to sign a contract three months ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Before yeah. that, I was just sending invoices and a PDF document. I go, yeah, he shouldn't, we'll do that. So, so yeah, you're yeah. sort of, I don't know, because you end up, I don't know, people just like, yeah, Chris sounds great and we'll do it. And yeah, like you have probably way more inc- incidences where they get, they, you do get paid and it's all good. But it's yeah. those couple that happen like, fuck, yeah, we definitely need to get this ordered. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you never know until you need it. Until you need so, it, yeah. Like, as I said, we've... So, so would, you, would you swallow the payment and get it done sooner rather than later would, would be the advice? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it works out okay for us because equally it is a kind of a learning process. So we, we had things like um, kind of decent tip in terms of our, our rebate period was a free replacement. Yeah. So that enabled us from a cash flow point of view as we were growing um, to, to not be shelling out if we did. I mean, we had less than 3% of our placements in our time of, of actually been a rebate. So it's not a huge issue with the business. We've got really good kind of retention in terms of our placements, but it did mean that if something did go wrong, then we weren't actually having to give cash back out of the cash flow. We were just having to go back back, back to square one and, and kind of work again. So there, there were some like intricacies of them that have worked really well so but i mean certainly if i could do it again i would definitely kind of do the boring legwork and get them done properly as we yeah. have now done but so it's the, the other than those two things those are probably the two standout things where i could physically go they cost us money cost, as yeah, yeah yeah fair um okay so so as, as we come to the end of this then chris what, what what's been going on in your world over the last eight to 12 weeks or eight eight ish weeks what how obviously 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 you've been really open honest with us on where you got to year in the business year two you're halfway into your third year probably yeah. sort of a bit frustrated because pro, pro, i've heard it so many times over the last couple of weeks we had our best quarter was on the plan to do this 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 yeah. I'm sure you've sort of fell into that i guess what 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 yeah what's been going on in your world over the last eight weeks um yeah just as you said we'd had february was our best month ever we then had march and we'd done another 22 percent of it so we literally had february and march best both from an invoice and a, and a kind of new business point of view so we're in a good spot and then obviously it it landed so <laughs> we um i feel like where we are now like we we're, we're in a good spot as a business so we we had some i had to make some kind of difficult decisions certainly most difficult decisions we've had to make since starting the business so what did you we, ask, like what so i think we were quickly quite quickly to get people working from home and be fully remote and then we did that as a, as a business as a whole for certainly a couple of weeks but then obviously the, once the furlough situation so i've put eight so we're 18 people eight people are on furlough which was either the more junior people in the business office manager like back office support resource uh, junior people or, or one person that just recently switched markets so the, the kind of patch wasn't established enough for them to kind of have a decent client base that would still be hiring so that was a difficult position obviously we are a, effectively a self-funded startup so yes we've had a lot of success i think in hindsight so for example there the business loan i took was a three-year loan that were paid off in two years the money i borrowed off my dad was a three-year loan that I paid off in 18 months as a business we were debt free but I was really keen to try and pay them off as quickly as possible which then has an impact on what cash you've got within yeah, the business yeah, yeah. so naturally my first thought was let's look at the cash flow like you can run a business on a loss for, for quite some time but you're only going to run out of cash once so once the severity of the situation happened um, a furlough had to be done and then we made the decision of those that were left, we were going to defer commission payments because our commission structure is very good. We're shelling out 35, 40 grand a month in commission. It's a big way of us kind of adding to the runway effectively. So yeah, yeah, we yeah. Made, made, made the decision to the guys that we would just, we'd still pay them, but would just defer that commission and not be paying it out. until. How, how was that received? Uh, amazingly, was, like I said, it was obviously not a conversation I would want to be having with them, but I think there were, if ever there's anything like that, we, we just kind of walked them through the thought process on perfectly transparent in terms of this is our yeah. this is our position as a business this is our thought process behind why we're doing it the end goal is that we protect the business and then there's still a job here for you and at, at the end of it i think the way it's, the way it's played out as i said the everyone took it really well there's literally no question mark so uh, and one of the lads jack i remember messaged me when i was kind of walking back to the car i was like 
15 minute walk back to the car that night and it was about eight o'clock what time I was walking back after kind of sharing the message and it was the next day we were all fully remote so it was kind of the last opportunity I had of everyone being all together um so it's obviously not a good conversation you want yeah. to be having with people but Jack had messaged me saying 100 percent the right thing to do like the protecting the business making sure we're here like and they yeah, I love that decision, 100 percent right I was just literally sat in the car park in my car just waiting like a little baby <laughs> <laughs> um Oh, yeah, so it was perfect. How, how did you, because I think, like, I, think, I think the challenge then, a lot of sort of what I've been speaking to people is then getting that balance with the people that are working. Do you know what I mean? Like, have you have you then been open and honest about are they getting their commission deferred or have they had to take, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how, have you, how have you balanced that? Because I think that's where sometimes there could be friction and then Jack might have gone, I know what we have to do, but it's a bit unfair to the, the guys that are working. Do, do you know what I mean? How did you approach that? <laughs> same for everyone so yeah see that's the I, thing yeah fair yeah it's got so everyone on everyone on furlough has been topped up to so we paid the extra 20 percent. so everyone's got 100 percent of salary um the deferred commission has been for everyone whether you're on furlough or not nice everyone will also get that money so it's not as if we're saying right we're just cancelling commission yeah, 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 yeah. protecting it they will get that money everyone has a confidence in those in the business that we're we're going to do we're going to do so so yeah, I'm the same with any decision that needs to be made. You can't do something for one and not for everyone. It's got to be the same for everyone. Otherwise, yeah. you're just going to get yourself in problems. And that goes back to your the kind of authenticity of having mm. open, honest tr- like conversation and communication with people. You, if you tell people how it is and there's no lies, then you're not going to get yourself caught out for this on the line, are you? So. Yeah. And, and I think, obviously, one of the things that you shared with us on this is that, obviously, clearly something you're really um, passionate and proud about is, is the culture and the people you have in the business. How have you gone about... Again, I think that's been a real common challenge for people. Like, so you've got the bench of people on furlough, you've got the bench of people working. How have you ensured that there isn't that sort of divide of sort of fucking out, like from the people that are working, it's all right for them. They're watching Netflix all day, watching Tiger King all day. It's all right compared to the guys on furlough. Do you know what I mean? Thinking about fucking out, they've got the call up, I didn't, I'm not good enough. I think that's, that's an interesting balance, right? So I guess what have been some of the things that you've done to make sure that there's still that togetherness and the culture that you've worked really hard to do but remotely? Um, so I guess our, our ultimate goal was just to try and replicate the normal office environment and culture as much as possible remotely. So I've, I've certainly had never had any conversations from any friction between furloughed people versus non-furloughed people, but that kind of goes back to hiring the right type of yeah, people exactly, the right sort of culture sure. and the mindset. So that's never, certainly never been sh- shared with myself. Like we do things as a group, as in everyone in the business. So every Friday afternoon we'll do the, kind of teams video stuff and do all like we did racing last week or we'll do because as, as every business is doing so we do everyone at least once a week is doing everything as a team to kind of keep that mentality together and keep sharing what's going on and we'll do like around robin 30 seconds what you've done for your week and awesome. whether that's pe- people talk about what is at work or vice versa if people have watched netflix all day then that's what we'll <laughs> yeah fair and what's been um because i think that the other sort of I was speaking to a business owner about this uh, this week. I think the other balance in that is then like, have you like communicated any expectation of your staff who are on furlough? Do you know what I mean? Because I, um, I think it's a, it, even, I think it's going to be a valid question, which is what did you get up to on furlough? Even from like a me recruiter and I'm working with talent and they're on furlough. Like, do you know what I mean? That's going to be an interview. That's going to be an interview question. What do you do on furlough? Um, so like, I don't know, have you, have you put any expectations on, look, it'd be great guys if you could do this, like, you know, you've seen all these self-development, learning, blah, blah, blah. What's been your approach on that? Um, so we, A, we keep in touch with them regularly. So it's not as if they're just kind of furloughed and we don't talk to them for 10 weeks or whatever. <laughs> so they, they were sent kind of from day one, we put together like the things that they could do. So whether that's Skillshare, whether just, I think I yeah. coined your, your phrase from one of your things about keeping match fit. So whether that be Skillshare stuff, whether that be personal branding, we, we sent out reading lists or people to follow, nice. books to read, that type of stuff. So just people, still people can keep engaging. Quite a lot of people have done that. One of the guys I was talking to yesterday has started to learn Python programming and he's trying to create a commission calculator for us when we return. Love that. So we'll just pump it like stuff like that. So some people have took it. Other people are flat out doing... Courtney Black fitness sessions and they're going to come back ripped to pieces I think um, so like there's no pressure on what people want to do like we're engaging with them if they want to do self-learning and stuff yeah, nice. great if they don't then no yeah. pressure you do what you want to get you're never going to get this opportunity again are you so yeah yeah, yeah. 
No, fair. I, I think, yes, yeah, it is optional. I think th- there's just a challenge there where, you, like, if you put someone on furlough and then expect them to, like, use that all that time productively and efficiently, I'm not sure about that. that, that no. yeah, it's, yeah it's, I think but it's been a challenge. So, I guess, okay, so, I guess, look, thing, obviously, as, as we went through this, talking about your business journey up until now, what, I know, obviously, when we, before we put this in, you were sort of, you was really keen to, you really felt like, you haven't achieved a whole lot and wanted to sort of wait to reach certain milestones. But I guess sort of a lot of people hear the sort of numbers you're hitting, the thing that they may see online, what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll really sort of have a perception of that you guys are doing really well. But I guess from your, from your experience and, and the learnings over the last two and, a, two and a bit years, what, what do you think has, has sort of been really important that's enabled you to sort of build the platform and, and sort of have, to uh, and, and hopefully another third successful year do you think what have been the sort of key things that have really enabled you to do that would you say to sort of wrap this up 100 percent, just the people yeah so i think like we like our our kind of ethos is very much people over profit so you put your people first hire it doesn't matter how good our brand was if we could still have srt if we had rubbish people in the team in the business we would do rubbish it's that simple so is the quality of people that you hire, the quality of people, and then retaining and motivating and keeping those people happy is, is the absolute key in, in what we do. So I think for us to keep scaling and keep growing and reach our ambitions, then it is all about identifying more and more and more of these kind of good people that are going to fit, fit with our ethos and stuff. But it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter what you do with your business in terms of your setup and stuff. It's about making your people as good as they can be and get it the, hiring the best people you possibly can that's the that's the name of the game for me mm. I think where, 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 where would you like to see sr2 and what's the sort of vision in the next two and a half years then um so we there's kind of lots of things on our agenda at the moment so st- still growing so i think our kind of aim with bristol would be to get bristol to kind of 40 50 people we've started as of 2020 doing europe so we've started a kind of berlin function and we're starting to build out so steve one of our co-founders is doing that um, we're launching a new product uh, in the next couple of like early June called SR2 Scale, which is going to be like a subscription service to our clients. Nice. Um, so we're, we are kind of diversifying our offering. We've talked about kind of statement of work and consultancy piece as well. So I'm very conscious of not trying to kind of do too much. Yeah. Um, but, but equally, there are lots of things that we want to be doing as a business. I think we've been quite successful with trying new things and if it doesn't work just fail fast with it so Mm. so there's lots of things that we're now doing that maybe weren't in the business plan at the start that have been really successful so there's there's lots of new new different things in in the pipeline of various stages that are exciting but ultimately they will lend itself to to growing and growing the business growing the headcount obviously as you say growing growing the actual gp that we're doing love that so what, what, um, before I ask you the last question, what, what are you most excited about or most excited to do after COVID, after we uh, get out of lockdown, what are you most excited about? What, work, work-wise or not? Just, just whatever, whatever comes up for you. Um, personal, got, professional. I guess personal, I've got, my wife's pregnant at the moment, so we've got a, a three-year-old, stupidly just got a puppy, and then now we've got a newborn on the way in July the 4th, so that's pretty much number one priority <laughs> um, at the moment, um, certainly from a personal point of view. And then I think from a professional point of view, it's just getting everyone back in the office and trying to get some level of normality together. I think it's a bit I, like, you do miss that. I think everyone's saying that in our office, like everyone just misses that camaraderie in the office and being around people mm. all the time. Because I'd say our culture is strong, so people do then miss it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's absolutely key for me. It's just going to be a challenge fitting everyone in the office with a two meter distance, and that. Yeah, exactly. well, I think we're going to do like half and half, and do th- half three on site, two from home. Just, like, do yeah, that yeah, yeah. Nice. Half the office, but yeah, I suppose a lot really of people don't think of that. Um, last question, Chris. So, if you could um, communicate to every single recruiter out there, they'd they'd listen, they'd take on your advice. It could be a word, a phrase, a sentence. What what would you say to the people? Um, if they were, if they were listening, what what would Chris say? What's that from a new startup point of view? Just just in general, like if you could communicate to every single recruiter out there that that would take on your advice, they'd listen. What what would your message be? 
I was about to say, don't be a dickhead. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think just like, it's just be yourself, like be authentic. I think if you are being yourself, you're naturally being authentic and people will buy in. If people buy from people, people, people will buy into you more. You'll be more genuine and just naturally be more authentic. I think too many people try and either be someone they're not or companies will try and create like recruitment robots out of people. Like for me, it's just like be yourself, be authentic and people will naturally tend to gravitate more towards that than someone who's trying to put on a show or be someone that they're not, I think. Ultimately. Mm. No, awesome. Chris, honestly, been a pleasure. Um, really excited to see where you guys are in the next two and a half years. Definitely have to do this um, <laughs> again, hopefully face to face. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, but no, it's been an absolute pleasure, Chris. Thank you. Cool. No worries.